you're on. I'm going to mute everybody. All right. Well, for those that are new, we'll give you the whole spiel and let you know where you are. You're at the Mosh Pit. The Mosh Pit is actually the love child of IFMA, Facilities Management uh, Association, and Workplace Evolutionaries. They got together on a warm, st uh, stormy night and listened to Barry White, and then the Mosh Pit was born. Actually, it was after COVID just started. We got together and had a few um, special sessions on how to fortify our workplaces against the new threat. And after the first three, um, David said, you know, I'm thinking about hanging up the, the, the hat and giving this thing up. And I was like, no, let's keep the wheels rolling. So here we are 161 episodes in and far beyond the two weeks that we thought we'd be out for COVID. We talk about everything workplace. Our mission is to change the world one workplace at a time. And we do that with a few different goals in mind. One is getting outside of the US centric mindset. Thus we have me hermano, hermanas from Mexico. We have people from Canada, also brothers and sisters from Europe, sisters and brothers and in the US. So we wanna get outside of the US centric mindset because a lot of different regions of the world are doing a really good job with the future of work. Uh, we also want to get out of the usual suspects, although the VPs of real estate, we have them here. Architects, interior designers, we have them here. The heartfelt brokers, they are here. We have conversations and leverage their expertise as well, but we also look to go outside of the usual suspects. We want to bring HR to the table. We want to bring finance to the table. We'll go to clinicians. We'll go to leaders of state and talk about some of the problems that they're tackling because in learning about what they're tackling and how they're doing it, it gives us more tools in order to solve the problem we have before us with the metamorphosis of work and workplace. With that said, uh, this is a safe place. We have something called the people's elbow. If someone has a uh, different idea, an opposing thought, it's welcome. Please share it here. In fact, the best pits are when we have at least two to three people's elbows delivered, always with love. Um, other than that, pay attention to the chat because a lot of our pit members are authors, very distinguished, a lot of experience. You'll find a lot of resources in the um, chat. I'm going to save those and guarantee you will leave one new pearl of wisdom. And Jamal, I'm talking over you because you're losing your internet con connectivity, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's going in and out. So I'll take over there. Usually what Jamal says at this very second is, David, have I missed anything? I say, you've hit all the salient points. And we do this sort of thing in our sleep for 160 episodes. Today's 161. It, it epi today's uh, epitomizes uh, to me how far out there we go and how different we all are. In setting this uh, Zoom registration up, I immediately said, "Oh, you know, libraries. This is just, this is another. This is part of the ecosystem of activity-based work. You go to the library. It's heads down. Priya Parker." Uh, uh, greets you with horn rimmed glasses and reminds you that gathering in the library is a quiet place. And then Chris and Shirley come back and say, uh, uh, you see, the thing is, the library is data science. It's about how a corporation uh, disseminates information. And then they said a few other paragraphs, but I, I went blank. So we are going to hear today uh, their perspective of what a corporate library is all about, the definition of it, and then, and we'll take it from there. And, and we're gonna we're gonna do it right now. Remember, this is recorded for a reason. We cut every uh, episode from an hour down to five to seven minutes, and it is sent out on Tuesday morning. But say whatever you like. We're okay with it. Uh, with that, what is a library? Thank you, David. Let's see if I can win with technology. Perfect. All right. In honor of La Fête Nationale or Bastille Day, which is today, we're going to start with the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, France. This was founded in 1300s. I think it was 1368. You can see people 
cards, microfish technology. They've honored information in all different facets and kept that as part of the, the experience of place, but certainly have moved forward as have all the others. Um, this is in Norway. It's about air and light as well as print materials. Alexandria, Egypt. This is a relatively new library, but the hieroglyphs on it date back to 3100 BCE, one of the first forms of writing. So it honors a library as a learning space, as a historical space, as a museum, and the history. Um, unique approach. This one is in Taipei, Taiwan. It is a library, but it's not about the library. It's about the trees. It's about sustainability, biophilia, the experience right. when one comes to visit it. Shout out to Kevin on the bookmobile. Here's a con contemporary bookmobile. They are in both urban and rural settings, and they bring the books to the people so that they can read wherever they are. This is an interesting one. This is Tama Art University Library in Tokyo, Japan. What's interesting is there are art forms, but that's not particularly common in Japan, but it is somewhat reminiscent of Lu Khan's work and it honors some of his work in Asia um, in particular and in the US, but in particular in Asia and in Bangladesh. This is in um, Tajin, China. This is a new library, relatively new library. Notice the books as design. Nearly all of them are inaccessible by people and yet it's part of the experience and also knows the sphere. This is the new Shanghai Astronomy Museum, which also considers itself a bibliotheca or a library. It's in Shanghai, China. If you write the word China in the Chinese ideographic characters, the first character is read Chuo or Naka, which means middle. And a lot of the architecture we see, recent architecture, interprets that to be middle or core or center that center of, of the experience. This is a library in Denmark. It's a human library. You can check out a person and they can tell you stories. A library is truly a collection of stories. It's information. It's not necessarily about place, though historically that shared knowledge was primarily written and, and therefore stored in, in a central location. But the mediums and the modalities have changed, certainly in the business workplace as well as in academic settings, but not necessarily the need for it, the need to attain knowledge, the need to share knowledge, whether it's onboarding, training, mentoring, or leadership. So what do you think? Uh, oh, surely I, I forgot if that was the last slide or not. And I'll yes, it is. Jump, jump right in, uh, or, or David and Jamal. Should I let someone else jump in first? I can be. Watching. No, you, you two are basically Jamal and I are like flies on the wall right now, and everybody else <laughs> just are like like uh, a Wonder Woman's cat. I mean, we're just we're just we're looking, we're waiting, we're ready. Waiting. Yeah. So uh, thanks for putting this together, and and I am in a stolen bookmobile right now that I stole just for this. And I've been in the mosh pit before, but because I'm leading the discussion, I am prepared like never before for anything that may happen. And when Shuli and I talked the other day, I think we agreed. And, and I said my daughter, who's six inches to my right, look up the dictionary definition from the library for me. And it does mention books. And the root of the word is books. But, uh, you know, it's really about you know, people information, technology, perhaps space, perhaps not. And I think one way to think of it is, you know, information being pushed, being available, being curated, you know, libraries are socially constructed. So you can't say a library does not push information. It does merely by deciding what's in the, in the collection or which databases it subscribes to. So, but I think the definition of a library, I think it's worth it to think about it conceptually, but in the end, the takeaway from today is, you know, what can we do for our workplace? And if it's a library hybrid with something else, that's fine. So I think it's it's good to probe the concept, but more to deconstruct it rather than to like have some dogma about what your library would be at your workplace. And so this, 
you know, coming off of what Shuli said, with the addition of, I believe there's a liquor store near me called the Wine Library. We should add that in there too. Um, to think of today as as the library as a tool, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But one way to to think of it is not, oh, we need to have a library. We need to, whether it's books, chairs, people, wine, is we have these challenges and opportunities in our organization. How can a library help solve them? Like almost like a parlor game. So I think if you take what I said and then what truly kicked us off with, with some awesome images and the French Revolution was maybe the first mosh pit in history, um, then uh, I think we're set up for a good conversation here. And, and Shuli and I want to want to learn and listen way more than we talk and quote unquote teach. Yeah, uh, very cool. Why don't we set them up into uh, a couple of threads and people can grab onto any one of the ropes that interest them. So uh, uh, the data, the data science, the different ways, frequencies, transfer information, a corporation using it that way. That's A. B, what I love, my confirmation bias, library is a cool, quiet place. Rules are understood. So when you want, when an extrovert even wants to go heads down, you don't have to be uh, Susan King, right? You can, you can be an obnoxious salesperson, but you walk into the library and you understand. And you look around like at like 10 libraries in New York City, it's just like you're thrown back 150 years and they're warm and inviting. Very right. Very cool stuff. Well, besides data science and the library as kind of that that place, that node, what, what else, Chris, would be a thread for us to talk about? I think Julie suggested it with, with uh, the Chinese etymology and center and I think, you know, connective connective tissue. And I think to, to talk about a university library in particular, universities are so sprawling, they're so decentralized, and we could have a conversation whether, you know, uh, UC Berkeley is more decentralized than the Coca-Cola company, but uh, they're, they're, they're decentralized and libraries are inactive, especially inherently, but also I think of library staff, where if whoever would run the library at a company um, looks at the library's collections and activities as a way to bring people together, either in general, just socially, and see what happens, or around a topic. Um, and I, don't get me wrong, right? Oh, we're gonna have a Friday brown bag. Some of these things might crash, but how can the library, from its central vantage point, where it's got an understanding of the needs and the opportunities of the organization more than most do, how can it identify opportunities to bring people together? And so. I think center or connection is one. So we'll say ideas, center or connection. And then maybe we say flexible third space to be democratically wielded as one once. I, I don't, but those are just off the top of my head. And if I could add to that, um, it, contrasting university libraries where Chris and I have done a lot of our work versus the public libraries versus corporate libraries. Uh, the, pub the public libraries did have a tradition of quiet and of elegance and of gargoyles and lions so that the, the procession, the threshold going into that did change that, that feeling, the sense of belonging there. But libraries in the campus settings for at least 20 years really haven't even been called libraries anymore. They're called learning commons or academic commons. And they have a focus on um, connection be for this, for students and community to the content, um, but that learning commons meant the um, the math center was there as well. The writing centers were there as well. The technology support and the help desks were also there. Archivals, if there were um, art museums as part of a campus, some of the archival work might have taken place there. So it um, it has transformed into that learning commons. It's also been um, it's ju juxtaposed with the social engagement the social commons, the, um, the social engagement spaces that universities have created, those areas where you have the food and the food service, although we're starting to see a lot more, at least the, the coffee shops, but the food service also joining in with that academic. So 
academically, libraries have completely transformed into an academic space and a social space, sometimes combined, but very often separate compared to the workplace libraries, which it's also called the library, but it's such a completely different concept. A lot of the libraries that are being created in the workplace are because they want to get a well AP if they want to, or the well certification, which basically mandates having something, or if they recognize the need to have print materials as a form of mentoring or a resource. So it's a very different um, criteria. And surely I would jump in on that and say, you know, and I did, I did a library project last year, um, Michigan State, and I had sort of gotten away from, gotten into like, nah, the collections or whatever, it's really about the space. And I realized in doing that project that the collection still really matters, not just to the very professionalized librarians, but if you're in an organization where information matters. And uh, I think that will remain true even in an age of AI. Um, how, can, how can the collection be leveraged to make that third space, that connective space, the learning commons more, more powerful? Yeah, so that, I'm not trying so to talk out of both sides of my mouth. I just think it's it's a deconstruction, right? And then pieces to work with. Yeah, excellent point. It's kind of, this is kind of like a he said, she said. <laughs> Since Chris and I have spent so much time on campuses, the, I'd say in the past five years, most of the schools that I've worked with, no longer, past 10 years of schools I've worked with, they'll actually look at, think of the human. We walk in through a gate, right? And the gate gate count says a person has entered into the library. But we have all of this information on the equivalent of the of the gate counts, the check-ins and check-outs on the books themselves. And most institutions are looking at the books themselves and looking at which ones are high volume for use for checkout in print form. And that's really what's driving what stays on the campus and what goes on campus. And you just put a, a little bus out there that goes back and forth once and twice a day. So you can reserve something and it's brought onto the campus for the student. And once it's it, once it's returned, it's brought back to a less expensive storage space, and that's a completely different approach. But it's definitely a direction we're seeing in higher education and on campus, be, um, workplace campuses, because it's so expensive to house those materials on on the campus footprint. Starting to look at less expensive alternatives for print, keeping the digital easily accessible with that support. And then keeping those things that are unique, the art books, the books that include photography, something that has a visual experience that you can't necessarily replicate in a digital realm. Yeah, there's something about the art book, taking the, flipping through the pages, right? The coffee table books, it's the, almost that purpose. What about this, you two, um, on, on, and I think we'd all agree the greatest campus in the world, the University of California at Berkeley, you've got Doe Library, which is right out of Paper Chase, some opaque floors, uh, bookshelf, you know, narrow uh, pathways between books, extremely uh, quiet, long wooden oak uh, tables with the alabaster green lights, click, 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 you know, turn on your own uh, one. You hear a pin drop, uh, a three minute walk, Moffitt Library, that's where you would go because you knew that the third floor had social galore. So you could you could talk there. People would hang around. They shush each other. But the culture was, hey, you you're coming to the third floor of Moffat to uh, to chat it up, and you could always go and hide in another corner on the fourth or fifth floor. What what is it about these different types of libraries? Does that resonate with with you, Shuli? You just showed us an example of 10 or 12 awesome places around the globe. But what about the different environments that they that people have turned them into? Yeah, again, there's an excellent point here about libraries having music, books, technology, maker spaces. Most universities, when they first came out with 3D printers and maker spaces on the campus, they put them in the libraries because that was the core space that the students gathered. It was a core gathering space. It wasn't about the, the books as much. So yeah, there's no question that you've got the variety of spaces. If you go to most university libraries today that have more than just a couple floors, so any substantially sized library, there will be um, actually noise, designated noise levels by floor. You might have the top floor is the quietest floor. That might, be, because research shows that math and science, the natural sciences, 
um, and the empirical research tends to need a quieter space, might be at the upper levels. But as you um, sort of matriculate down and you get to the lower levels, those floors will be by design a little bit noisier. They will be more for writing, for poetry, for anything that has a little bit more of a creative bent to it. And, and the university floors that I've visited on that first floor, it is noisy. It is the food, it is social, it is the support, it is a group, it is the collaborative meeting spaces because after the classroom experience, the students want a place to meet, to gather. So we're actually seeing many universities now de designating different decibel levels by floor. Cool. Hey, have we seen that aspect or what have we seen ported over into the corporate uh, environment? So YouTube done so much for universities. Um, what, what have we what have we seen uh, in play in the corporate world? Not enough. <laughs> well, I, I, I <clears throat> sorry, actually, were you going to? That's very succinct, and, and maybe that's uh, all you had to say. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to say that I had um, had a, written an article, sorry, that sounds self-serving, about how the uh, relationship between people and space in corporate was going to start to look like what it has on campus for a long time, and more plunked down more shared space. No students have pictures of their parents, grandparents, or kids that they tote with them and then, you know, pull out of their backpack. Um, and, and, you know, and, the, and then all the implications for planning and for designating spots as quiet or, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I thought that that is what is happening in the workplace and that some of the, and scheduling, whether it's systems, processes, who can bump who? Can David come in and kick out a little peon because he wants that space? Um, I think there's a lot to be learned. So in a, in a much less succinct way, uh, I agree with what Shulie said. Yeah, one thing I think that we as workplace strategists definitely need to focus on is um, nomenclature. In fact, there was something in uh, LinkedIn this morning about we don't have common definitions for terms and that not only should we look at the root definition of what a word means as we're starting to apply the concepts of it, but also figure out what we can do with that term. So a library really does need to advance significantly for the workplace. It needs to be thought of as an academic meeting space, a social meeting space. It needs to be thought of as the core or the heart of the campus experience because it is today in universities. It typically is the core building. It's, it's the place where people will congregate or meet. Very often photos after graduation are taken in front of that. That's where the statues sometimes are. So we really need to, to advance the concept of what the knowledge um, availability is when we're starting to design these libraries or advancing the libraries in the workplace. But we also have to look at the, the people and what it is they want to connect with. Knowing that mentoring does take place in the office it shouldn't have to be a huddle room that gets reserved on a Friday that seats two people in one display. That doesn't feel that good. We want to have that mentoring experience surrounded by the sights and the sounds and the brand and the experience that comes with that, that core feeling, that core belief. And I do think there's um, movement towards that, but I think one of the positive responses that we could have to the pandemic is building these awesome community spaces for gathering for a variety of reasons, but also for a variety of resources. And that's why I really think we need to think of them as those resource common common grounds. And surely I think even though I started by saying it's not just about space, it's about, as we had discussed the other day, you know, ideas, people, technology, I think you're not wrong at all to mention space and maybe the question I was about to ask of people is, okay, now that you've heard us speak for a while, what are your thoughts about how you would start a library at your company or flesh out the one you already have? But I think your point that you just made is good, which is you're, you're coming off the pandemic, you know, your company's still tussling over return to office and the Luddites and others are like battling. And maybe one thing you could say is here's X square feet. 
It's going to be for the library. Make this space awesome. The rest of our office can be made awesome in three months or 13 years. Let's just have the library be the coolest space, like, in the whole workplace. So just a thought, uh, and I would be interested to hear what people are thinking as they hear us talk, is this, like, barking any plausible ideas, or is it still, like, not? <laughs> yeah, well, Chris, Chris, we've got a couple of hands up already. And the first hand up, of course, yeah, confirmation bias is coming from Michael Scher. He's he thinks of things in blocks of you know what you can get to within 15 minutes. So he's looking at the ecosystem around uh, uh, a city. I bet. Tell me I'm wrong, Michael. Tell me you're thinking we've got the libraries already. Do we need to sp spend five million dollars in a corporate environment and have these cool spots? Well, I I don't know if that's exactly what I was going to ask, but thanks, David. <laughs> I, 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 you, you know, I just saw that, uh, of course, the libraries have now been handed a whole bunch of money for for uh, broadband connect and connectivity uh, investments. So so that's going on. But I guess the question really is 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 broader than that. And that is that, you know, it, you know we, we really know that that one of the um, uh, impact items that we really felt no, no uh, pun intended, uh, it was the. Um, uh the, the relevance of our networks and our telecommunications capabilities in terms of moving forward and we've and we've all known that for 20 years all of our processes have been going through some level of digital transformation um it, you know at the very basic level just the conversion of of data to for, into a digital format but at the uh, higher end levels uh you know the decimation of music stores or uh, uh movie theaters or uh, uh now office buildings uh, so you, you know we we see how powerful these technologies are and in the area of the libraries because the the, the common location the, the function and I'm, I'm kind of referring to a lot to the public libraries um you know i'm hearing uh from from those that i deal with in the in the broadband investment areas uh the efforts to try to capitalize on digital transformation in multiple domains so it's not just the library but it's recognizing that hey digital classrooms are something that we need because we really need to promote ongoing education and opportunities for people in the workforce uh telehealth clinics as part of a a, a uh, integration uh, uh element in public uh, libraries is uh, something that's being experimented with so I'm, I'm kind of wondering from your vantage point are you seeing kind of a uh, a gathering of these forces and services into an architectural design into a community design that really kind of says hey this is a new frontier for us in this area Julie or Chris? Um, I would say, oh, go ahead, Julie. Oh, no, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, I'm, I'm thinking of, of a, uh, a project I'd worked on, was it a municipal, at the DC Public Library. So I think the answer, Michael, and I would just want everybody to, you know, weigh in on what I'm starting with, which is sometimes, yes, physical is good. And in the case of, let's say, a municipal public library, it's people who are, um, whose housing is such that they need to go someplace for things that others are fortunate enough to not have to go somewhere for, like quiet and Wi-Fi and food. So there's that. And then I think more in, in an organization, it's funny, a record store was, you know, ostensibly to purchase records or CDs or eight tracks, whatever. But it also was like a gathering place and you could browse music and, you know, maybe you ended up down the wrong aisle and that's how you learned who, you know, whoever Bach was. And it's much more efficient to buy something on Amazon that, you know, is that social aspect missing, that people want it back, do we wish it came back for more social cohesion? I'll stop there, and I think my point is just that the role of place, uh, you know, it could be to meet a need, it could be a latent function that we actually miss once it goes away, and um, I guess my answer in, in being pretty uh, 
emergent there. I don't mean to have answered the question, but I think, Michael, you raise a point that's got some complicated answers and situational answers, if that makes sense. It does to the common man. What about the complicated woman, Shuley? Um, I think it's okay to take some of the definitions that we historically had for the purpose of a library and set them aside and build new ones, a new reason for gathering. In academia, we go to the library because we have to and because we want to. In business, we ought to be able to go to the library for both reasons, because we need to source information and because we want to source information. So I think the title it, itself needs to be, needs to evolve to something completely different and more advanced. How many of you are in book clubs? How many of you shifted during the pandemic to book clubs online with a glass of wine? Okay. How many of you miss getting together in person with people? So that's the, <laughs> so the, the purpose of a library is the gathering experience. The resources are there for us to make a big difference. And without the resources, it would be harder and it would be digital and our eyes would get really tired and we'd be wearing glasses. But the purpose is to, is to pull together the resource and the human experience. It's not about one or the other. I think that's where we can succeed in workplace strategy, building those gathering spaces that are so core. And it's a, it's a feasible thing to do because the... Um, the cost of elevating that experience in that one core area is going to be far less than changing out all of the desks in, in the working areas, in the offices. Very cool. It, Fred, I'm going to pick on you since you made a great comment. Um, and then I want the room to think about uh, his comment in the chat uh, applied to, you know, what is the new corporate library if you were trying to create a corporate library environment. Hey, Fred, can you elaborate a little bit on what GT is doing? Oh, great, yeah. Um, so we have a lot of collaborative study spaces. We have a lot of open spaces. If you check out some of the, the link that I put in the chat and just kind of browse over to spaces and technology tab, you can look at some of the things that, that we're actually doing that are really innovative from print studios, computer studios. We have a maker space in the library. We have collaborative study rooms that are technology-based or just tables. We have what's called the Grove, which is a, a wooden staircase for group study, quiet study. Uh, it's giant stairs, I guess, really. It's, it's a, a pretty cool place. And Georgia Tech's always trying to be on the cutting edge. And, and while we are a technology institute, you know, we understand that you're always going to need that library. Now, I'm based over at Campus Rec. If you can't tell behind me, there's the building. Um, and I'm a, I'm a recreation junkie. I, I, I would have, you know, we're looking at updating some of our spaces and putting study lounges in the recreation center as well. So that, that people who are here to recreate, they don't have to leave this building to then study. So what are some resources that we could tap into with the library and have shared space. So we're already having those conversations here on our campus. Um, yeah. But this is a really cool topic. Thanks for picking up, David. I miss y'all. You know, I, I, I'm glad you're back. And thanks for that comment, especially the, the last couple of sentences, which I've got a feeling we're going to see in the in the short. Hey, Chris, I'm going to bounce over to Kevin unless you, uh, while you're driving. No, no, no. I was just going to... I was going to say amen to Fred and say how many people actually read on the exercise bike already. So I think he's so right, but that's all. Yeah, and, and I think it, the reason I, I called it out for video editors is because that comment, uh, that little vignette of, you know, uh, challenges the whole ecosystem activity-based work philosophy. It's sort of like, oh, we're going to have all these different nodes. Oh, I, I need to... I need to hustle and run to get to the next node, or or maybe that's something that you can do in your immediate area. So I think we have to think about the whole person in specific nodes. So I love that. Hey, Kevin, what's on your mind? 
Well, what's on my mind is there's another version of library. Um, right now, the conversation is, is a duality. It's there's the corporate library, which by implication is almost private and accessible to employees. And then we have the public library, which is funded somewhere and it's open to everyone. And I want to point out, sometimes you got to follow the money. And there's a third notion, if, you, if anyone knows the Boston Athenaeum, right? This is a library space, A-T-H-E-N-A-E-U-M. Uh, Boston Athenaeum is a membership library. You pay to be a member here. I live not that 15 minutes walk from it. I have been a member. And, and the value proposition, when we look at what people pay for, and then you mimic, you get a proxy for what people are willing to pay for, which is a proxy for what people value, right? So the button, Boston Athenaeum, uh, go to their website. It is a beautiful space, right? And that's what they promise. They promise a peaceful space, a beautiful space that members can meet in. It's a library, but it's also a museum. And they call themselves a cultural center. And I think, so that, that's one statement, follow the money. The second statement is I am of the era where I remember a lot of, and I've been in a lot of corporate libraries. Um, if you ever visited the he corporate headquarters of a company that was founded before the 1950s, they almost always had a corporate library. Um, consulting companies to this day have corporate libraries and still hire um, they're now called something different, but when I joined um, uh, Gemini Consulting at the beginning of my career, we had three full-time librarians. And the library was a place for our corporate resources, for those expensive subscriptions that was all, that was all gathered in the one place. So you knew nobody would individually subscribe to these things, but the corporation subscribed and we could go down to them and these trained librarians uh, could help us navigate to the information we needed to um, further the interests of the corporation. But also in that space, the history of the corporation was maintained. It was like, look, here's the charter of the consulting company. There was always a section on the history. This is where we've come from. And the library was used to store the the documents of the past, the annual reports of the past years, where we've come from, and what we also need to know to go forward. And we have guides to help us with what we need to know to go forward. And it had a space to connect the dots of insights. Um, so, so I think those elements of celebrate the past, point our way forward and connect the dots on insights, those elements don't go away. And if you ever look for what is for a space that people pay for in the corporate real, in the real estate world, I'm sitting here at an industrious workspace. Don't be deceived by the beige wall behind me. The public spaces, shared spaces are beautiful. My, my office is the least decorated, least colorful place in the whole damn building. Um, uh, all the all the paid meeting rooms have are beautifully designed and bright. And there's coffee, there's sodas. If you're in Boston, come visit, come try out our our community space. There are gathering spaces. There's couches. There's books that are sitting there. Nobody's ever going to read the books, but their books is decoration. In old libraries, when I was studying, books added acted as insulation, meaning it kept the place warm and it kept the sound out. Uh, so, so I want to go back to this, this idea that as we think about the co-working space, we're thinking about gathering spaces and we're thinking about community spaces. And so if we take the lessons of um, co-working spaces and we bring them to the specific environment of a library, then we now think of a space for celebrating culture, the past pointing the way forward, getting interaction and interactivity. And I'll close by pointing out that 
the Boston Public Library, just a, a few blocks away from me, in the entry, the street level entry to it, there's they they now host recordings. There's a studio built there. Forget no talking in the library. They're not broadcasting from the damn place. There's a studio there for public uh, radio and they they record radio shows. And it's one of the few places you can go to in Boston that if you want to see the governor of Massachusetts being interviewed in person, you can see him right there and other public figures. And it, it also celebrates authors. It celebrates community thought leaders. It celebrates uh, diverse ideas. It's a gathering place for ideas and dissemination of ideas. And I think we, we can't lose sight of that primary function. It wasn't to be selfish and go and educate ourselves. It's to curate and gather what is relevant to the community around us. And that is, and to ex amplify those insights and gatherings around what's relevant. And I think we shouldn't lose track of those in, in a beautiful space. And we shouldn't lose track of those fundamental elements. That's perfect. You opened a lot of great threads uh, in the in the remaining 15 minutes. I want Catherine, Gary, and Donna both to get in in the first portion of that. And then at any time, uh, uh, our two fearless leaders who kicked us off, uh, Shirley and Chris, can jump in. Catherine, what's your favorite thread right now? Well, um, I have an observation and a question. Uh, the observation is that I've been a library hound since I was a small child, from bookmobiles to small town libraries, through all the way up to corporate libraries. One of the things I've always treasured, because I have been a regular um, participant in a library experience, is the relationship I developed with the librarians. So I think Shuli, you took, talked about the humanity and the human aspect of this, and that's, there is, I think, something very unique and important about that role. The question I have is, has to do with the discussion around the issues around hybrid work, and would some kind of co corporate library, as it were, workplace space, be something that is unique and of value that brings people back, of course, back to the office. I think the dialogue around that is, oh, great, I'm going to get up and drive and go to a cubicle somewhere. If there is unique resources like the very concept we've talked about with the library, even a way to access mentoring, perhaps, do you think that this would bring in uh, so, sort of a, a new way to to un, unfold how the the workplace could be more valuable to people. Yes, absolutely. Yes, if we tell people you've got to come back in three days a week and go back to your desk and sit at your desk and trust the people around you that you know a year or two ago that were vaccinated that weren't sick that were well it, we're okay to sit and work with and then you're going to do your heads down work that's a lot less attractive than come back to the office where we do have a library equivalent space and we have social engagement and we have resources and you can see work in progress. I appreciate the comment earlier about past, pregnant, present and future. John Seeley used to talk about how the architecture studio was by far the best conceptual space because you have a place to work and then you have a place to pin up your work in progress to see the progress that you've made on something, to let others see it when they show up. Imagine a, a workplace equivalent library where you could pin up your work and others could see it in progress and, and see what that looks like, what your thoughts were, how you were evolving to an answer, how you closed a deal, how you developed in, in R&D, how you engineered a new product, what you were thinking about. I think it would be far more attractive to get people back to the office if we did create these really cool learning spaces than we just told them we've got better cleaning protocols for your desk. I love that. You know what I heard, uh, Shirley, or what I, what I imagine as you're speaking, um, besides the fact that the video editor is going to capture part of that, is the idea of a tactile Slack. We all love Slack if you're in an environment that 
doesn't allow it to cobweb that keeps it going. The mosh pit started a great one year and a half ago, but you know, there's only so much time and energy and it cobwebs, of course, like many of them do. But if you had a physical tactile environment that you could sort of slack things up, you know, in the real estate world, we have uh, aerials all over the place. The most recent, you know, uh, acute oblique and straight up and down aerials. And everyone that that is in that profession looks at it like an engineer looks at a semiconductor chip blown up you know we know the history with all the little uh dots so when someone puts up a little tag and says in play or another little sticker that says congratulations uh sally on the assemblage you start to go buy it and you pay more attention to that than you do the emails uh drawing conclusions or, or sharing stuff i really like that idea of a library um Gary, what's on your mind? All right, I think Donna was before me. No, no okay. <laughs> I just want to applaud, uh, really um, echo what Kevin and um, Catherine both recognized in the role of librarians. Um, yeah, so these are beautiful spaces, you know, places that keep evolving in terms of their functions and um, you know, moving from artifacts to technologies, they'll keep changing. But I'm really curious, like, what are we doing to replace the the value and benefit of librarians? I, I can't tell you the no, no number of times I went in with a question or a topic or a line of inquiry and came out after talking to a librarian with a totally different worldview on that subject. AI is not going to replace it because it's providing the answers. The librarians just pose questions. And, and kept reshaping the query itself. So what are you seeing in terms of librarians going away and what's replacing what really is a beautiful curation experience? I, I would jump in and this is Chris, he's uh, getting better reception this way. I think you're totally right. I think librarians are more important now and certainly at universities, they need to throw more, a few more bucks their way. But uh, to, to your point, thinking about how to maximize the impact of these librarians, I mean, first, you know, they're, they're helping us discover things accidentally. And I think the accidental discovery of information is important to preserve in a world of algorithms. And also, I think all this goes to what kind of company you have. So I was going to say, like, libraries could be good if they can engender collaboration, or a librarian can be good if they can really help you think in ways that are novel, and then that begs the question, what kind of company do you have? How do you create your jobs and your teams so that those things actually are like important, thus making, uh, giving an, uh, an opening for the library to matter? So I think if you're a crappy company, like, then you're going to have a crappy library. Uh, Donna, why don't you jump in? Yeah, just building on on things that have been uh, expressed so far, and also just really underscoring uh, what Kevin was saying. Um, in terms of bridge building, um, it's sounding like there's some potential opportunity for uh, also building on good stuff happening in 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 those campuses where cool stuff's happening, as Julie is, was describing. Um, but taking on uh, even more of a bridge building role in communities and society and between, um, you know, between sectors and, and, um, and so that sort of got me thinking, and you know what, I wasn't even sure I could show up today or whether this was one that I would have much to say about, but um, the thing that I particularly, you know, interested is, as you all know, is the bridge building that we need to do and the order of change that everybody is going through and the and the thinking about learning ecosystems all different ways of learning and i think part of what we've been wrestling with is is seeing place making places as a way that people can touch down in all kinds of different places in multimodal ways to connect to learn to um, collaborate to be creative and innovative and, and you know, we also know that not everybody reads as much these days. So looking at multimodal ways of, of bridging and 
um, bringing learning to life and bringing books to life and using, you know, using technology. And you may have seen that, I don't know if, if you, you folks heard of the, the human library. I put it in the chat. And um, has anybody here heard of the human library? Yeah, I'm sure you would have, Shuli. Now, I raise it because, wow, when we think of the themes that have come up here and in other places about the need to uh, uh, break down silos, understand um, the whole, you know, the issues around diversity and inclusion and um, valuing difference and, and serious, you know, issues where people tend to judge each other um, from a distance. The Human Library, I'm trying to remember the date that it was set up, was a way that people could put themselves out there and be taken out like a book from a library to listen to somebody share their story, their lived experience. And it might be a homeless person, and it might be a, um, you know, somebody that, that, that has uh, gone through some, you know, major changes in their life. And it can be somebody who's, you know, from, from any part of the world. And it has been an amazing movement that has grown, ama you know, amazingly, and, and it is being used in some of the universities I know the University of Glasgow, for example, um, have, you know, built some links and we have as well. Um, so I raise that because I think what this conversation is doing is asking us all to, you know, to think about how could we get really creative with this? And, and those that are involved with their libraries or, you know, who do you know there? And then also thinking about how academia has to change too, right? I mean, change, we need it everywhere. Um, you know, there's a lot of the academic programs that aren't kind of keeping up with what we really need in society and research that never actually sees the light of day and doesn't actually make a difference anywhere. So it's really looking for ways that we can mix all that up. Donna, I love it. I love it. And uh, two more up, seven minutes on the clock before we go after hours. Uh, Elena? I will first um, miss you all so much, uh, David and Jamal know, but I had a really big bout with COVID, uh, my, our first one, but it was really quite severe. And then a virus for two was not getting on the cold tail. So it's just, um, it's been a, a tough little few weeks, uh, but very good to hear you all. So thank you for having me. Well, we're, we're glad you're back. And I, I want to let you know what I'm dropping in the chat, if you can see your screen, is the 18 minute video edited from Mosh Pit number 62 complex systems i don't know elaine if that rings a bell with you oh for sure was i at that okay. one? yeah thank you for leading it you and, grammarly uh, go that hour and a half was cut into to oh, 18 great. minutes so i i thought you did a spectacular job with that and seeing your name i decided oh, i pulled it down you. from the youtube so well, what's guess, on your mind so quick update then um and i'll i can share more but um i think you all know i've started my phd and it is on complex systems and i'm trying to get as close in one phd as possible to an equivalent of the table of elements periodic table for chemistry but when it comes to transformational change so what are the elements how do they come together are some of them preconditions are some of them optional so um i'll keep you posted on that um but yes complex systems are very very close to my heart look there is uh, one thing that i shared in the chat um and that is uh from my one of my favorite podcasts 99 invisible if you haven't come across them they're great they pretty much take things design things in everyday life we take for granted and unpack them and um the reason i shared that is up until early 20th century, children weren't even allowed, um, let alone the concept of reading uh, rooms for kids in libraries. And I think that what's been discussed, I just wanted to emphasize that it is about censorship to that access for accidental discovery. So I'm really interested in questions of what, sh what should we be discovering? Who is currently somehow um, disallowed from that discovery? And how do the libraries of today and tomorrow break that down, just like libraries have broken down the, these other barriers. But um, also in the spirit of knowing me, a couple of gentle people's elbows. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, um, Donna just introduced that, that people just aren't reading as much. And we're seeing this as an intergenerational shift as well. Um, I, you know, we all agree who knows me well that I'm 76 on the inside. So I appreciate that I'm a bit uncool with these things, but I will acknowledge that new formats, I actually listen to about 55 books a year and I only read about 12. So I'm all for new formats and all of that kind of thing. But I do think that when we talk about discovery, 
we have to somehow find ways to consciously counteract this desire for just tiny snippets. We're all trained on a 15 minute video. And if you haven't grabbed me in 15 minutes, if that in 15 seconds, if that is the logic, nobody would get through Tolstoy, right? It took me the first four hours to even get interested in some of that stuff, right? And also taking offense at everything and how quickly we take offense. I have read and I've forced myself to read books that offended me deeply. Hemingway, such a chauvinist. Like there is just really disgusting to me thinking and logic out there. But I, being 76 on the inside, I don't think it means that I shouldn't read it and that I shouldn't discuss it and debate it, right? So I just wanted to bring those things because when we talk about discovery, if we're, if we, especially the younger of us, are just going to get offended within five seconds of seeing something unkosher, or if we're actually not actually going to ever read anything, because some of that, and the last comment is boredom. Um, one of the things, lots of research has been done on this, that creativity actually comes from boredom as does discovery, right? And again, some of these longer books, I mean, Moby Dick, my God, I, I it took me years to finish that book. It was so fucking boring. Finally, I listened to it at almost twice the speed. And I know I'm sure there are people here who love it. But to you still have to sometimes, and I got to appreciate it and all of that. But you know what I'm like? You have to almost be bored and you have to allow yourself that, which is very contrary to how we want to consume information now. So again, if libraries become just these 15 second, you know, uh, finger food kind of places, I think we're still going to miss a lot of what makes us kind of human and chew on this information. So that's me. That is great. That is the, the irony of uh, someone who spent the first 16 years learning on the planet in Russia, uh, talking about, you know, how you have to eventually re revealing you have to allow yourself to be boring because anyone who's tried to dive into anything written, the but top pretty much 100 any Russian author uh, is not unbelievable, a unbelievable, unbelievable, no. <laughs> the, the, the pain and suffering, what it takes to get through it and, and the anguish of talking about discontent and, and loss and the identity of a self, it goes on forever. Incredible. We'll get to that irony later, but right now with, with two minutes left, we're about to go to Lori. We're going to keep on going until dawn. We're not going to stop today, but we are going to pause for a moment and think, uh, uh, surely, if we can do a, a little golf clap, everyone, we're going to we're going to uh, raise our hands and thank uh, Shuli and Chris for taking us to the library. I love it. Well done. Wait a minute. I, I had a hand raised. Lori, get back here. You know, you're going to have to follow both the uh, Russian intellectual trained and my uh, my glassy thank you. What what was on your mind? As you unmute yourself, because my, it, it thank you, <laughs> didn't realize I was on mute. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm uh, Lori Rothenberg. Um, so I, I think a number of these points are really um, interesting on the library. For the collaboration point, I feel like the library needs to offer. Um, a perspective a little bit different than the other collaboration points within our offices that we're, we're pushing as collaborative, right? It needs to be somewhat distinct because we're saying our cafeterias are collaborative, our pantries are, our hallways are, right? We're trying to push all these different areas. Um, so I really like the idea um, of the knowledge sharing and the source of information, um, especially as companies have so much more turnover, you lose a lot of that institutional knowledge. And so to have something where it's a source of that institutional knowledge, um, you know, there's lots of projects, but once the person leaves the company, it just is gone forever, right? And you don't have those emails, you don't have those, whatever, closing binders, whatever it is, the do old documentation. So I think that having a place like that is really useful. 
Um, and I really liked what um, folks were saying about the different multimodal education, because I know for me, when I read the newspaper online, I, you know, you're directed really towards certain types of information. But if you're, if I have a newspaper, for example, in paper format, I find things that I wouldn't have read otherwise. And I think that if we have colleagues that can wander around a room or a space, and be able to get information. It's a different type of those random connections that we have with people, but instead it's random connections with information. Um, so anyway, but I hey, were... Lori, great point. You work at a yeah. company that's been around for almost 200 years. Yeah. I've got to think in the 1950s, they had libraries that were, were sacred. Uh, are you aware of, of what Pfizer may have at Hudson Yards or elsewhere? Well, so we have, I mean, we have an archive system where everything gets shipped off to Michigan, right? And nobody really does it anymore because everything's now digital. And then if somebody leaves the company, retires or whatever, you, you have to download it. And then only some people have the link and then they change over, you know, from SharePoint to Box or whatever other program it is. And then that information is essentially lost. Um, or it's an archive and it takes a very long time to get that information. So it's very helpful to have something where even if it, you know, you would need somebody like a librarian or a knowledge man, somebody who's a knowledge management expert to have that and be able to access that information. One other thing that um, we have done is similar to the idea of getting um that history, we have an exhibit that kind of goes through the history of, of COVID and it's it's to try to give the history of the company um, for people to walk through. So it's a little bit like that. Um, so I don't know. And, and then, you know, I think back a few weeks ago, you had um, the discussion on why uh, people are coming to the office and it's for focus. I mean, that's all I keep hearing from people about them wanting the, the breakout rooms and, and the quiet areas. So I do think that we can't abandon that benefit of the library as well. So. So, yeah, I wonder if that's something that uh, your workplace team is, is thinking about how do we expand either the library or the attributes that a we talked about today that a library has. Yeah, I mean, we we have an increasingly extensive online learning program, but it's all online, right? So, you know, thinking about it in the physical sense, right? It's, you know, beginning conversations on that. Very cool. Fred, again, so glad you're back in the, the pit. What's What's on your it's mind? Been a minute, man, it has been a minute. I've been really slammed at work and uh, doing a lot of project stuff here at Campus Rack and getting our getting our facility ready for fall semester. So, um, but uh, to Laurie's, Laurie's, Laurie or Laurie, I hope I'm not butchering your name horribly. I say it, Laurie. So I'm Laurie, I'm okay, saying, great. So. <laughs> um, to your point about, uh, you know, workplaces uh, incorporating collaborative space. I think where workplace teams may have room for improvement is envisioning these as intentional spaces. Right mm -hmm. now, they all seem very generic. Uh, while they're quiet spaces or collaborative spaces, if we could theme them around, you know, intellectual space uh, and, and add these areas in that are intentionally designed to provide that thought-provoking element that the the library for instance that is a great intentional space and we I forget who it was earlier that talked about you know making the the corporate library more accessible bringing bringing it back in so I, I really appreciated that that made me think of that you know let's build it intentionally around this and then in the, in the chat too uh, Connie says many libraries that curate the experience around themes and stuff we could do the same thing in, in workplace when we're designing our spaces and be very intentional about and i think i'm painting with a very broad brush mind you very broad brush i think a lot of a lot of organizations are just trying to do something generic and basic that they, they hear their employees want these collaborative spaces but 
they don't know how to do it in intentional ways. I think more information from employees would be a great starting point to get that. Like, what kind of collaborative space do you want? Do you want a space with a coffee maker or do you want a space with a smart board? Or do you want a space with very dim lights? And like getting that information back so we can know what to do for our employees in workplace. That was kind of uh, what I had, David. Yeah, it's great to be back. I missed everybody in the pit. It's great to see so many wonderful faces.